The Invincible Teams podcast is powered by Evergreen. Evergreen provides teamwork, training, and consulting to help your team thrive in every season. If you want to have a team that makes other leaders jealous, get started by going to their website in the show notes and scheduling your free consultation today. Welcome to Invincible Teams, a podcast for team leaders and business owners who are tired of dealing with drama and politics, high turnover, and teams not meeting their potential. We know that team leaders and business owners like you are pretty much always under pressure to get the most out of your teams. And we believe that every team should reach their potential and that if we get intentional, our teams can become invincible. Welcome back to the Invincible Teams podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Mayfield, here with my wonderful co-host. Alexis Gerben. What are you doing over there? You're like, <laughs> are you checking your social media? What are you doing? <laughs> Distracted. I'm here. I'm here. I promise I'm here. And I'm excited about the guests that we have today. Vaughn, tell us about yourself. Well, thanks so much for having me on. I'm so excited to be on and to be talking about a topic that uh, really has uh, been a tool of liberation for me, uh, for the people I lead, influence my family. Uh, I can't wait to talk about the five years today. Yeah, well, we are excited to have you here. Uh, Vaughn Moore is uh, part of our giant ecosystem. I'm sure uh, many of you guys have heard us talking about uh, giant and a lot of the tools that they offer. So uh, Vaughn is in that mix with us. And yeah, as he mentioned, is going to be talking to us about a tool called the five gears. Uh, Vaughn, you are uh, president, owner, founder of Elevated Leadership Group, which I want to make sure that we get a chance to talk about a little bit later. Uh, you're out of Colorado, uh, which is great. I, uh, Colorado, I've spent several summers there. I'm a big fan. Colorado. A beautiful state. Yes. It really is. Uh, but we're excited to have you here today. Uh, today, what we want to talk about to start out, though, is this idea of work-life balance, right? It's kind of a hot topic today. I feel like a lot of people are talking about the idea of work-life balance. Um, and so I guess I want to start by asking you guys, when you hear that phrase, you know, maybe we should define terms a little bit. What do you think that means, work-life balance? Wow. You know, um, I think we've been talking about work-life balance for a decade or more, maybe even two. <laughs> mm. And um, the reality is, I, I think there's this misconception that we can actually uh, truly have a balance in our life. I think we, we in fact, kind of are on a seesaw often where we um, are on a journey of kind of self-correction as we understand a little bit more about ourselves and how we're wired and how others are wired, we, we go back and forth. And so, um, you know, it, it was thrown in our, our, our faces last year um, because all of a sudden there was no distinction between work and life, mm. work and personal. Mm. Yeah. Um, totally. And so uh, it became a huge hot topic because people were um, um, falling apart because they didn't have the tools available to properly identify the things that were going on in their life that caused stress and um, problems. Yeah, hmm. I totally am so with you. And I, I, I feel like you are hitting the nail on the head in the fact that it's never a perfect calibration, it's kind of a constant recalibration, right? There's never this point where we hit perfect balance and everything's in sync. Maybe once in a while, it feels that way, but then life is life and we are human. And so the recalibration and the constant moving back into harmony, I always think harmony is a better term for it um, versus balance, because there's a, you can, you can definitely live in a state of harmony on the regular, even when things are imbalanced, but there has to be that intentionality, right? Instead of accidentalism, intentionality around constant recalibration. Absolutely. Mm. That's good. So, you know, coming off the heels of 2020, Vaughn, like you're talking about where we are kind of all forced into uh, this environment where work and life are hard to separate and everything seems out of balance or out of harmony to use that word, Alexis. Um, 
you know, this has been a big conversation. Do you guys think that this is really as important as it seems, or is it just urgent because of where we're at right now? Is it something critical or do you think this is overblown? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's so vital. I mean, incredibly vital <laughs> to, to be Why able to, um, well, so we're gonna we're gonna get into the five gears. The five gears is a tool. It's a very simplistic, uh, simple tool, not simplistic. Simple tool. It's really a communications code, okay? Because we often find uh, we're at loss for the words to describe what we're feeling or a challenge. And so, to be able to have, um, it is a visual tool. Of course, it's a podcast. So the visual tool, if you just imagine the gear shift of a car, it's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. This tool allows us to be present and productive when there's not enough time in life. And I think that's where we find ourselves. Not We just don't have enough time and we're either productive or we're present, but we're not both. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, no, and I would, I agree so much in that. I feel like, yes, Ryan, to your question, it is, it's essential, especially now in 21st century American culture where if you want to be on 24 seven, you have the opportunity to be on 24 seven and where we used to, I think just, you know, in light of looking at work and rest where we used to have to go to find, we had to go find entertainment. We had to go find work. We had to go find noise for centuries. Like your noise, what didn't have constant access to you, your work didn't have constant access to you. Yeah. Maybe when you're on the farm, you're, you're, you're constantly cultivating what you've, what you have and the work that's in front of you, but it's not like in your bedroom. It's not necessarily in your kitchen. You know, you're not constantly having to turn off all the channels. Now there's, it's this intentionality that we have to have to actually turn off all of the communications that we have to the outside world to actually recharge and to actually reset and recalibrate and do all of the things that um, really allow us to be full fledged in the work that we do. So yeah, I just, I'm totally with Yvonne in that it's, it's an essential practice. It's an essential um, tool that we need to learn in order to be intentional around our time. That's so good. And, um, you know, this is maybe a little bit of a tangent here and I may edit it out depending on how long this thing ends <laughs> we'll up being, see. We'll see. Uh, but do you guys have any idea, um, what, uh, relation, this conversation that we're having now, and, you know, this influx of needing work life balance, what's the relationship to trains. I love Brian. He always comes up with these like random, just like connected, disconnected questions that are going to come back around to connect. I have no idea what the answer to that one would be. Vaughn, any I'm guesses? Gonna, I'm going to do a wild guess and just say <laughs> that um, when you're on a train, you, you know, you, you can only go one place, you know, and uh, sure, you once you get to that place, maybe there's ways to uh, to go to other places, but you're 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 heading in one direction so am i close well no but you're far more <laughs> profound than i am um, <laughs> gonna dig, it's a little more trivial no no my um <clears throat> what i was just thinking of is you know you guys are talking about how your your work comes to you your your all these things come to you now and they didn't used to uh, and there's been a ton of research done around just the idea of time and um, where we started keeping time and regular time where your time is the same as my time um, put us all on this schedule of hyper productivity where we have to meet at this time and get this thing done by this time um, and uh, historically the matching up of times across time zones and things was all due to railroads. They had to make sure that the trains ar arrived on time and didn't crash into each other. And, uh, and so they started setting standardized time, which really changed the game for people's productivity. Right. Um, and so I think it's been a constant, um, you know, um, it's been speeding up right as as years and decades and millennia has have passed that there's been this increasing burden on us to manage our time to get more done to you know to continue to produce and so i think that's one of the reasons why this conversation is so important right now i would argue more important than it's ever been 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just thinking too, the, there's a title. I've probably brought it up in a podcast previous of a new book that came out last year during the pandemic by John Mark Comer, who is a pastor out in Portland, Oregon, but the ruthless elimination of hurry, um, which maybe I just stole your thunder bone. Were you going to bring that up? No, but I mean, I love his stuff and uh, yeah, yeah, his podcast. We're, we're always listening to him. So much. I'm such a fan. And he talks so much about what we're going to get into as far as gear one and Sabbath and recharge and all of that. But um, just how that term in and of itself suggests how hard the the process actually is Mm -hmm. right like to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives hurry is kind of the norm at this point thanks to the trains i guess all the way we'll take it all the way back (laughs) um which obviously like created incredible capacity for productivity and efficiency and you know on so many levels we need the scheduling all Mm -hmm. of us jays appreciate schedule but at the same time um there is such work to actually mark out space and time for recreation remembering reflection all that stuff that's just so essential so well just to piggyback on that um and we'll get into what the gears are in a little bit but um there's a tendency for us to stay in one of the gears too long Mm -hmm. we will We'll, we'll get into, you know, our focus mode or, or task mode, and we just won't get out of it. And um, what happens is that we unintentionally run over things. Mm. We run over people <laughs> because we, we just forgot to downshift. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so that, that is another, you, you ask, you know, whether this is important or not, Ryan, it is absolutely important because we're, we're unintentionally uh, leaving a, a trail of wreckage behind us. Mm-hmm. We don't even know it. And everybody is doing it. Yes, very much so. And that I feel like especially some of our greatest leaders who, you know, have the most incredible capacity for forward movement and for momentum and for creating incredible scaling, incredible companies and doing incredible things. Very often the cost of that is the lack of awareness to what they're leaving in their wake. And I think you're right. It's, it's good for all of us, whatever gear we get stuck in um, to actually recognize and be self-aware in what our tendencies just tend to be. Well, let's get into it. I'm sure people are like, well, okay, what, what are we talking about thing? with these What's five years? So, uh, Vaughn, I'm going to turn it over to you in a second, but I just want to say that if you're listening to this right now, um, in the show notes for this episode should be a link to be able to actually see the five gears uh, diagram that we're talking about. Uh, and so, Vaughn, assuming that people can see that, but maybe some of them can't, why don't you walk us through this tool um, and explain to us what the five gears is? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, so... Uh, I mentioned it before, you know, five gears. It's a, it's like the gear shift of a a five speed manual transmission car. And, uh, you know, I grew up uh, driving one of those. Uh, So it's actually, that was the first car I I drove was actually, it was a a manual transmission uh, Subaru, (laughs) a station wagon. Classic. (laughs) And I don't know if they still have them, but it, it, they were famous. One of their marketing gimmicks was they had the hill holder clutch. <laughs> okay. And so you, you put in the, the clutch and it automatically held your, um, uh, your brake for a little bit until you were able to get into gear if you were on a hill. Well, that didn't really even help me very much. I mean, when I was learning to, learning to drive, I ground the gears a lot. <clears throat> and as, uh, as you start to practice Um, being present and productive, um, you will find that, you know, you might lurch a lot or uh, shift in, you know, not very smoothly, or you grind uh, gears. And one of the, one of the reasons is, is that uh, we are a a very naturally productive uh, society. And uh, so I'll, I'll just really start in the highest gear because, um, all right, so I'm going to ask both of you a question. Great. (laughs) We'll take it. Uh, and actually it's a very, uh, it's kind of a popular, um, uh, survey topic, uh, for Gallup and for others. It's how many of you sleep with your phone by the bed? Great question. And 
I have purposefully moved mine in the last few years um, because I think we're on the same page on this stuff on that. I I'm like on myself now around a lot of this ruthless elimination of hurry. But um, yeah, I've actually, I used to sleep with it like next to my head because it was my alarm clock, all of that. Now it's around the corner in the kitchen, plugged in, still actually uses my alarm clock, but I do that on purpose for the sake of like having to get up so and go turn it off. Up. Good yes. job. But I actually got myself, I, again, we're on audio, so nobody can see this, but I could show you guys my little red alarm clock that I got myself because I literally wanted to have an option so that I did not have to have any connection to my phone during the night. How about you, Ryan? Uh, so mine is uh, on the table next to me, but I'm very uh, strict about like that. Do not disturb mode. I love that. So um, I don't get any sort of notifications or anything like that um, right. whenever I don't want them. Awesome. So I, uh, I do sleep with my phone by my bed and, <clears throat> but I've broken my habit of, the first thing that I do, so actually 93% of people who have been surveyed say they sleep with their phone by the bed, okay, or in the bed. Actually, not, I think 50% of the 90% sleep in the bed. with their phone actually in the bed. And maybe nice. it's not quite that high, but anyway, um, the idea here is, is that most people will turn over and the first thing that they do is they check their email. Now, email is a very fourth gear activity. Fourth gear is all about task mode. Okay. Um, and so I, I started in fourth gear because that's where a lot of people start. Now, can you start a car in fourth gear? Mm -mm. Definitely not. It's tough. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't really start a car in fourth gear. It's, it's a, it's a challenge. It will, it will conk out unless you're on a hill and you, you know, get, get up some speed and, and whatnot. So, um, we tend to f switch back and forth between these gears throughout the day. So at the very uh, top, the fifth gear is focus mode. So people will get into the zone um, and, and it's not a often, it depends on your personality and, and what you do for a living and other kinds of things. But when you're in your zone time, when you, when, when you, you're working on a project and all of a sudden half the day is gone and you have like, I forgot to eat and, you know, those kinds of things. That's, that's fifth gear activity stuff. It's, it's high brain activity, really, really focused, churning out the work. It might be an author who is, is able to, you know, write two chapters in an hour. It might be, um, you know, a computer programmer who, you know, is, is troubleshooting some problem. It, it, it could be any kind of thing, but the, it's, it's really high intense focused you know, I'm, I, no distractions whatsoever. Whereas fourth gear is task mode, high switching, multitasking, emails, phone calls, customers, you know, uh, pop in, somebody, you know, uh, opens the door and says, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, can, can we talk about something, you know? And so it's very interactive. And, uh, this is where m most of us are a majority of the time. Now, occasionally during the workday, somebody will, will walk in and they'll close the door. This is if you're in the office. <laughs> a lot of us aren't in the office, but let's just say maybe it's a family member. They'll walk in, they'll close the door mm -hmm. and you'll realize, oh, we're, we've, we've, we've shifted into something different. So now this is more, uh, <clears throat> either could be social. Third gear is all about social. So it's can connecting with people on higher levels, like, you know, Hey, what's, what are we doing tonight for, uh, you know, after hours or dinner, we've got a dinner plan or, you know, um, let's go, you know, plan something, sporting activities and things like that. That's the social you're out having dinner or, you know, just, um, getting to know people a little bit better. Whereas if somebody came in, closed the door and said, uh, I got to talk to you. I'm really having a, uh, a challenge at home, or um, maybe they confess that they have a problem with alcohol or something. Now you're getting into second gear, the connecting mode, the bonding, the going deeper. Uh, it's the, the time where, um, you know, you're, you're, um, you know, out at the beach and all of a sudden somebody, uh, you know, uh, really starts to share, you know, some of their, 
hurts, or maybe you have had a major confrontation with your spouse or, or a best friend. And this is a time where you're, you're connecting, you're bonding, you're, you're creating this new level of relationship based on the fact that you've gone through conflict and now you're coming out on the other side and, and be building that deeper relationship. Then the, uh, the final, <coughs> final gear plus reverse first gear is all about rest and recharge. It's about, so all these other gears tend to expend energy and we're not naturally wired nor designed to expend energy on a constant basis. So of course uh, it's resting, uh, it's relaxing, it's um, disengaging your brain uh, from the work of the day. It's enjoying just the fact that you, uh, um, it, you know, it's a beautiful day or you can hear the, uh, the birds chirping or the wind going through uh, the, the, the leaves and the trees. It's the, the it, it really connecting with the sound of running water. It's a hike, even yeah. though that might be, um, you know, physical energy. A lot of times people uh, get energized by being alone on a hike. And it might be some people get energized by gardening. Some people get energized by reading. There's all kinds of different ways to rest and recharge. And that's an exciting uh, thing to get into. But unfortunately, our culture is in the second, third, fourth, and fifth gear. So often we forget yeah. about um rest and recharge. I'll get into reverse a little bit later, but uh, is it all that make it, making sense? So much so. I, I feel like there's so much that resonates in that and should resonate in that for, you know, different people with different personalities because different gears are going to be more appealing for different personalities, right, Vaughn? So it's like, you know, if you are, if you're an extrovert by nature, then that connect time, that gear two, gear three is actually kind of energizing, right? Whereas for, um, an introvert, you typically have the gear four, gear five, gear one, more so gear five and gear one that are more um, recharging for an introvert. And so it's just interesting to look at, you know, how different wirings then have different propensities um, in the gear space. And uh, two, I just love the fact that you brought up for different people, it's different for different people. Their rejuvenation is different, meaning that like, yeah, for some it's gardening, for some it's going for a run, for some it's writing in their journal. I had a girl who was a client of mine when we were trying to decipher, where do you rest best? She figured out it was cross stitching. And I was like, well, I haven't heard that one before, but great. So like, let's make sure we get some cross stitching in over the weekend, because that is her time where she just could, her, her fingers were moving, her body was moving, but her brain was able to recharge. So I love, um, yeah, I love diving into all this. No, it's good. And uh, Vaughn, I do want you to get into the reverse and talk about that because I think that is a, um, I mean, you could call it a lot of things, but I would call it a skill for mm -hmm. sure yeah. uh, that a lot of uh, people, you know, we, we need to learn because it's not something I think that's very highly valued. Uh, but before we jump into that, just a little bit of a recap. Five is is focus mode, right? Head down, working hard on something. Four is your task mode. You're kind of multitasking, switching between various things you got going on. Third gear is your social mode. So you're not necessarily working. You're you're more talking and and sharing about life, but not quite as deep as maybe a second gear, which is that connect mode, right? Where you're going deep, mostly in a one-on-one -on -one situation, family, close friends, um, things like that. Uh, and then first gear being that recharge mode. How do you rest? How do you recover uh, so that you can, you know, continue on in, in whatever else you need to be doing? So uh, yeah, I just wanted to recap those real quick. And then, yeah. So you want to tell us about the reverse now? Absolutely. So Reverse is um, something that uh, also our culture is not all that great at. <laughs> Agreed. And the R uh, can also uh, re um, relate to a response or responsive or, and not resistant. Okay. So this is a time in which um, we often are going into a, a place where we realize that we have, well, we realize we've run over somebody. Mm. <laughs> we, uh, we, we stayed in a gear too long. 
Um, we didn't use the right gear at the right time. And uh, we offended somebody. And um, this is something that, um, you know, is natural. I mean, all, all uh, you know, we are human. We're, we're always going to have to, um, to, to take a time for reflection on, on what is going on in our lives and go to those that we've offended and hurt and ask for forgiveness. And I think asking for forgiveness is, is different than apologizing. Apologizing, just letting people know, hey, I'm sorry for what I did. But if you take it one step further and ask for forgiveness, and sometimes you have to wait, you know, a lot of times people want to say, I'm sorry, and have the other person uh, say, oh, no problem right away. But sometimes uh, what we've done hurts and we're not ready to, to, to give the forgiveness. But if you've asked somebody to forgive you, then you've done everything that you can to set the relationship right. And now it's in the other person's uh, court to then either come back with some additional information that you didn't know about so that you can then reflect on that and ask for forgiveness again so that there can be a restoration of relationships. That's what I love the, the all these R's, you know, yeah. restoration, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> responsive, uh, you know, um, relationship. Um, and so, you know, reverse is not a, a gear to be afraid of. Uh, often we go too far down the street and we need to reverse to get back to where we're going. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just want to add to that, Vaughn. I feel like we can add another R in there in that it is one of the rarest <laughs> of the gears. No. And in the best way that our stepping into it and our willingness to do it is, I think really profound in light of the way that most people at this point in time, like to just kind of breeze by things like to, or not just like to, but, but it's easier and seemingly wastes less time than, you know, getting in the weeds with someone or like going back and reflecting on a conversation that you had a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, doubling back with a team member or a family member and actually just saying like, Hey, I really, I just want to touch base here. Like I, I really messed up and I, I need to ask your forgiveness. That's like shocking for people to hear, you know, cause it, it takes so much emotional intelligence. It takes so much perceptivity. It takes so much self-awareness, so much humility to just be willing to do it and not sort of assume, well, they'll be fine. You know, like just keep on moving. Um, so I, I think about just the reverse gear as also being one of the rarest gears that people are willing to get into. Right. What would you say about that? Oh yeah, I agree. And, um, I think, and this is a whole nother podcast conversation, but I think that probably the thing that keeps most people from going into a reverse gear is probably just ego, right? Yeah. Uh, because you kind of have to admit, uh, that you have done something that you need to reverse course on. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's a lot that people I think are afraid to lose, uh, if you were to do that, sometimes it's easier just to stay in fourth gear and keep on moving. You know? Yeah. percent, a hundred percent. I, I actually just real time had a moment a couple of weeks ago where I really significantly messed up and realized, oh man, I'm going to have to do what I tell everyone they need to do. <laughs> and, and I had to walk myself through the whole process of literally writing out all that I needed to reverse for the specifics of the scenario, what I had done wrong. And I just, I had to trust that like, it was not fully in my hands. So like you're saying bond that once you ask for forgiveness, like you have done all that you can to be able to usher in redemption, usher in, you know, reconciliation, but you don't have control over how the other person is going to respond. And that's just part of the risk that we run. And yet that is no reason for us to step away from it. If any, that's just, you know, more reason for us to step into it. Vaughn, uh, on this podcast, we try to talk to a lot of team leaders, business owners. So with that in mind, why is it so important, do you think, for people to, to use something like this uh, tool to, to maintain that balance, that harmony that we're talking about. Why is this important for those people? Well, I think it's because um, we all have a natural gear that we're most adept at using. Uh, a lot like the five voices, um, one, you know, one of the voices is harder for us to access on a natural 
technical basis, one of the gears is hardest for us to, to access. I'll, I'll just run through for you what my natural gear order is. I mean, obviously I'd like to say that I, I get up in the morning and I, I start in first gear and then I spend good time with my wife connecting and my family and I'm in second gear. And then I get into, you know, the, my, my work environment. And um, instead of right getting into fourth gear tasks, I, I, I connect with people on a, on a social level. And then I move into fourth gear and, you know, I get all my work done. And sometimes I go back and forth between fourth and fifth, you know, in order to get my work done in a, the most productive manner. And then I'd like to say that I, I reverse back into it all the way till I put my head on the, on the pillow. Um, but, you know, let's be real. That's not actually how life is. <laughs> totally. That's like, doesn't take into account all of the unpredictables. Exactly. And so I'll just tell you that, um, I have decided that um, I would like to embrace my natural tendencies and then uh, be intentional about how to break out of uh, um, those natural tendencies at the pr proper times. And so I use a schedule uh, and I've actually recently rejiggered my schedule so that I'm more in line with my natural rhythm. Okay. So I naturally do wake up and I want to get into my day pretty quickly. Um, so I've decided to actually, uh, you know, after I, you know, do all my morning, uh, you know, personal stuff, <laughs> you know, I just sit down at my desk and I crank out two hours worth of work in task mode, you know, and I might uh, switch back and forth between fourth and fifth gear during that, the, those two hours, but generally it's not, it's just like cranking through the emails and scheduling time with people and making sure that, um, you know, things have, are, are in order, uh, you know, with my clients or other people in my life. Then I will go uh, into second gear mode because, uh, you know, we are at home, I work from home, uh, you know, we're a homeschooling family. And so, you know, during the school year, everybody's around. Uh, I try and engage with somebody at some point uh, on a, a real relational and connecting level. So I tend to go f f first gear, fourth gear, second gear, first gear, I'm pretty, I I'm okay at first gear where I'm not all that great is third gear. I generally don't like to just be shoot the breeze, shoot the breeze with people <laughs> yeah, like and not everybody really wants to get into a serious, deep bonding conversation. Great. Great. <laughs> so, so that's what I kind of work on. I, I work on my third gear time uh, and I work on getting out of fourth and fifth gear intentionally. And so I think to answer your question, Ryan, why is it so important? It's, it's because it's an intentional tool. If we don't use this tool, we live life accidentally and we, uh, we run over people far more than we should. Mm. So what do you say then to the, yeah, the team leader, the business owner, who's like, Hey, look, I'm good at fourth and fifth gear. I get my stuff done. My team, you know, gets stuff done because I'm telling them what they need to do. Uh, why do I need to care about second and third gear? Uh, I would say because um, you don't know it, but you're losing influence. Mm. We, when we don't understand that other people operate differently than we do, and we expect everybody to operate in the way that we do, we unintentionally lose influence with others. And so when we, when we are in, in, intentional about um, the fact that other people are not wired the way we are and we start paying attention to, to the wiring of other people, our influence skyrockets. Mm -hmm. uh, people naturally now want to follow us rather than being obliged or obliga obligatory uh, you know, um, you know, work. Yeah. We inspire people uh, rather than um, making it be something that we must do. Um, people feel like they want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so as much as um, some of this uh, kind of sounds a little um, woo-woo, <laughs> it's not because when you put it into practice, you will see it almost instantaneously. Well, uh, it, well uh,
if you're really rigid in your in, in your ways and you start to to implement it, people are going to look at you like, what what's wrong with you? You're you're <laughs> you're actually be, becoming more human. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes me think too, just of the flywheel concept, right? Too, and the whole fact that when we are focused on capacity alignment execution, those are all essentials. However, relationship and communication come before them, they come first. And we sort of just always hope that they're going to work and that those are going to, you know, run themselves. But the reality is it's gear two and gear three that actually give relationship and communication, the attention, the time that it's neat, that's needed. And then I think the importance, just continuing to answer your question, right? The importance of it is that it actually allows for exponential capacity in, in Mm. alignment, in work, mode, you know, when we're actually working together because we've developed relationship and communication because our ease of connecting, um, it doesn't cause friction. It doesn't cause as much friction because we've actually spent some time, intentional time to focus on that. And so that to me is just another reason why we would actually put energy and time towards gear two and gear three. That's good. So as I'm thinking through this and trying to think where the person listening to this might be right now with this whole conversation. Uh, Vaughn, you, you did something just a second ago that uh, I think is a great uh, starting point for anybody that's entering into this conversation about five gears, which is just identifying where you're at. What's the ones uh, that come most naturally to you? And what are the one or two that, that are really difficult for you? Uh, I think, would you agree that that'd be a great starting point for people listening to this conversation? Absolutely. And it's not hard either. Um, you know, that's one of, the, one of the beauties of this tool is, is that um, as long as you understand what they are, you can actually start uh, communicating with people about this in a very easy way. I mean, once you've defined what fourth gear is, everybody knows. And if you're in a fourth gear time and you realize, oh, well, we've been in fourth gear a lot. Um, hey, let's intentionally shift into third gear. There's, there's, everybody is understanding, okay, well, we're now in a different gear, you know, and, and it, and it really actually helps also, uh, to prep yourself for transitions. Um, because sometimes we, um, we go into certain circumstances and situations in a gear and we forget to, 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 to change gears. We didn't prep ourselves before. And so we go into a situation uh, using the wrong, in the wrong mode. And again, like I said, we, we lose influence. So, you know, you can even, you know, uh, you have a, a hand signal, you know, Hey, it's, it's third gear time. Let's, or, you know, uh, Hey, we've, we've spent a lot of time in third gear. Let's, let's get back to work, <laughs> you know, let, let's, let's shift it back into fourth gear. Um, hmm. so now you have a, a, a leadership language, Right. That's really changing your culture, uh, wherever you lead and wherever you're of influence. And, you know, you can find it in the home, you can find it in the workplace, you can find it in your community, in your church, in your neighborhood, anywhere you go. Um, you know, people catch on to this pretty quickly. Yeah, I like that, uh, Alexis. What um, What are the ones that come to you most naturally? What are the ones you struggle with the most? So being the creative that I am, I really do love both fifth gear where I can ideate and really focus on kind of moving the ball forward, but, but ideating and innovating and sometimes just percolating on a number of things going on in my head. Um, Gear five and gear one really tend to be my gears that I love the most. And my connector self, my, my connector second voice loves gear two. Um, I'm not the pure blooded, pure bread connector that loves gear three. That is not my space. I actually tend to really despise small talk and kind of the shooting of the breeze. But I am the type that, you know, walks into a party and tries to figure out who can I nail down and have like a super deep scuba dive session um, in the middle of this, you know, what should be appropriately a gear three event. And so I've really had to work on that. That's been something that for me, because I naturally land in those gear five, gear one, gear two spaces, um, I've had to work on my capacity to just connect with people like on the surface. Um, because there's actually credibility that gets built in that. And that's something that actually Jeremy Kubitschek will say and has taught me is that it's really, there's appropriate times for gear three when just straight up like shooting the breeze is actually 
what needs to happen. And it's, it's not appropriate to go into gear two, you know, in those, in certain spaces like that. Um, and then I'd say gear four for me, is just a harder one. I'm not, my guardian detail is definitely not my favorite thing on the planet. And so just pumping out emails and, you know, doing my financial stuff is never the stuff that it energizes me. So that's kind of, that's like where mine all fall. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I would say gear one and two are the ones that certainly come uh, easiest to me. I, uh, I, that's great. I'm any chance that I can to like have that time, yeah. uh, I, you know, in gear one is wonderful. Um, and gear two, I mean, I, I, I love having, you know, one or two people around a fire pit or a handful of people around an incredible meal in my house. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, that gear three, whew, um, <laughs> none of us yikes. love it. <laughs> None of us are pure, pure bread connectors. Yeah, that's my toughest one for sure. Yeah, <laughs> do you do you not love Gear Four, right? Is that not something that you enjoy? Uh, I do Gear Four and Five. I, I like and think I'm pretty decent at, but mm -hmm. um, I'm. Uh, I think a lot of people get addicted to to those higher gears, right? Yeah. And um, and I just I, I don't want that. You know, yeah. um, and so that, that gear one and two is, is my jam. That's, uh, that's where I wish I could live all the time. <laughs> and what actually, I'd be curious to know what gear one looks like for you guys, as far as just, you know, coloring in for people, what different types of gear ones can really show up as like, what does gear one really look like for you, Brian? Uh, for me, so this will be no surprise to you, uh, that for me, I, I'm very regimented with, with stuff, right? It's, it's a very set schedule. So, um, throughout the, you know, regular work week, if you will, um, I'm up plenty early. I'm taking slow time to make a good cup of coffee. I read for a, probably a good hour most mornings. And, uh, then it's like kind of slowly moving into the day. So I'll catch up on some news and, um, and all those things like a little bit before I ever, um, you know, Vaughn, you talk about people waking up and checking email. I'm probably a good two and a half, three hours into my day before any emails ever get opened. Um, I just, that, that is my time and my emails are not allowed to invade it, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's a lot of what it is for me now, particularly on Sunday, Sunday is gear one and two all day long. Um, and so I, um, just as a personal thing, I use Saturdays in a lot of to, ways to get everything done so that I don't have anything to do on Sundays. And so it's literally, whatever me and my family want to do that day. It's normally slow. There's normally lots of good food. Um, and, and that's kind of it. So for, uh, for us and for me, uh, and I'm lucky that, you know, my wife, she does, she likes a lot of the same things in that gear one. Uh, and so we can, um, we can do a lot of that stuff together, which is really great. I'm pretty sure I've seen some, um, motorcycle, adventures on your Instagram, which I did not know That's until sweet. I followed you on Instagram and realized, oh, sweet. He likes to ride bikes. So is that part of gear one for you? Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. How about for you, Vaughn? What does gear one usually look like for you? Uh, gear one is, um, I like, well, okay. Like, like Ryan, I love a good cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, and I love reading. Um, I, I spend, uh, um, so I kind of vacillate between having a good morning in gear one and two and, and having a good morning in gear four and five. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's funny, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware of what is going on here. Uh, sometimes it ends up being accidental, like often like, okay, uh, this yesterday was a prime example. I couldn't sleep for a majority of the night. Um, so I slept in um, and I didn't really get, and, and when I got up, I knew that the things that were on my plate were not vital. And so, um, you know, when you, when you, when you're awake most of the night and you get, you know, s sleep from like five 30 to seven 30. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so hard. Then you're just not going to be productive, you know, at eight 30. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so I just, uh, you know, accept that and go, all right, well, I'm, I'm just not going to stress over that. Um, but most mornings, um, uh, like I said, I, I get into fourth and fifth gear. First gears are, you know, reading, eating, uh, spending time on my back deck, looking at uh, Pike's Peak. Um, you know, actually, it's funny. Uh, a first gear activity for me. Uh, I'm very hands-on with things, and I love taking things apart and putting things back together. So, first gear activities uh, that are not like totally restful but active are working on my car. Um, you know, taking apart an engine. You know. Um, working on our RV, you know, making sure that the new things in it are working properly and I get it, everything just right. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm that kind of person. So when I, when I, when I can get into that mode, that's, I, that, I, I really like that. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, there's a great definition of first gear Sabbath, kind of that whole concept that I love. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm from, I'm trying to actually remember where it's from, but I remember reading it in college as I was first learning about the concept of Sabbath. And it just talked about the fact that really like def definition of gear one definition of Sabbath is the nourishing of an emergence, mm. meaning that there's not necessarily any productivity that's happening. There's nothing that's being produced from that actual moment, but lots that is to come is being nourished. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've loved that for a long time in terms of for, sometimes for me, like if it's a really long week and it's really busy, I will sit and look out my window and that is gear one, you know, like just to be able to disconnect and to not have to produce anything, but to like listen to music or to pray or just to sit and seriously stare out my window is a real thing, you know? Well, and for a family, Sabbath looks different. Uh, we, um, briefly talked about this before we got on, you know, um, you know, what rest and recreation and recharge, uh, and worship look like for me is different than my wife and yeah. uh, is different than all five of my kids. And so, um, sometimes, um, you know, we just have to, um, there, there's a, there's a lot of grace that has to go into, uh, a Sabbath, yes. um, where sometimes, um, we actually do enter into somebody else's rest activity for the sake of being together as a family. Yes. And being together as a family is that restoration kind of thing. So sometimes um, we might go on a hike together as a family, which yeah. for the most part is restful, but sometimes, you know, when you, when you exercise too much, then you're exhausted. Right. <laughs> so right. You, have to, yeah. you have to balance, you know, and, and it's the, it's the, the natural thing in the family, but also in the workplace too. We can't expect that everybody's fourth gear is going to look the same right. as everybody's third gear. Yeah. No, I love that. And I love thinking about how to usher in Sabbath for a family like it's very possible that everybody's way of resting is going to look different at certain points during the day. But what does it then look like to have touch points through the day that are communal, like that are yes. everybody coming together and actually resting together. And yes. we were talking beforehand as well about the ruthless elimination of hurry and that whole, um, the book that John Mark Comer has written, but he talks about for his family in particular, I just love this practice on Friday nights as they get ready for Sabbath, they, have dinner together and like as the sun goes down they make this giant cookie they like bake this giant cookie <laughs> on a big pan one huge cookie they bake it they bring it out they put a whole gallon of ice cream on top of it everybody gets a spoon and they all go around and eat it together and they do their gratitudes from the week as their <laughs> way of like ushering in the sabbath and i just there's so much about that that i love in terms of the the correlation and the integration of physical, mental, relational, you know, social, spiritual, there's so much that just gets enveloped in a practice like that. And um, I loved that from a familial culture standpoint, because that really does like inform everybody, hey, Sabbath is starting. I love that. That's good. Well, I feel like we've spent uh, a good chunk of time talking about kind of first and second gear, but I'm okay with that just because kind of what we were saying before, our yeah. culture is very um, high geared, if you will, right? Uh, very much obsessed with fourth and fifth gear. I mean, to some degree, even third gear uh, for, for some people. But um, so I, I do like that we've spent a good chunk of time talking about first gear and a little bit in second 
so just as we kind of wrap things up here, what would be your guys' kind of parting thoughts to anybody that's listening, uh, especially if they're thinking about, okay, what does this mean for me in the business world? What does this mean for me as a leader? What does this mean for uh, my team? Parting thoughts on that? Mm, fine, I'll let you go on that one. Okay. <laughs> I would say that um, like any of these practices that we talk about on a regular basis, uh, it's, a, it's a gradual process. Um, you know, really embracing um, well, what we were just talking about, Sabbath. You can't really um, just go from the 100 miles an hour uh, lifestyle that we, we live to, you know, totally um, practicing it well. <laughs> And I would say that uh, uh, five years is the same thing. You're going to, you're going to mostly, um, you know, tomorrow when you uh, wake up and you start your new day, uh, you might remember uh, this podcast. Uh, you might not, it might come to your mind a couple days, uh, f- uh, you know, hence, and uh, you might recognize, Oh, okay. Well, so uh, what could I do to be proactive about moving into some of my less um, natural gears? And, and so it, like I said, um, if process, it's not something that, you know, you can really fail at. Uh, this is just one of those tools that uh, is a liberating tool. The more you use it, the better you become at it, the more natural it becomes, the more ability you will be able to be present and productive uh, with the time that we've been given, we, we, that's the one, um, commodity that we all have a limit of, you know, uh, we all have the same amount of time every day. Um, and so the question is, how are you going to use it? And uh, do you want to be intentional about how you use it? Some people don't. And so if you're that kind of person, that's okay. (laughs) You might be living with people who uh, do, uh, want to be more intentional. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this might be a tool that you, you're, you're able to easily share with this, you know, very easy communication tool uh, to others to give them liberation. Uh, no, I totally agree with that. It is a gradual process. I'll echo that. And then also my thought, just closing thought would be that mastering the transitions is such an art and really that that's where so much of the intentionality lies. You know, you can figure out kind of what each of these gears looks like for you, but then the intentionality is in actually choosing to shift, which we've talked a lot about, but um, I'm just very aware of that. I think in my own life of late, that transitioning is so key and being intentional about those transitions. Um, And so I think for any leader who's navigating this with themselves and then with their team, just knowing that, yeah, it's a gradual process and it's going to, so much of it is going to lie in the capacity to transition. It's just like, you know, in an Ironman or in any triathlon, like transitions are where so much of the time is either made up or lost. And I just feel like, especially if we are being intentional, right? Like if we're choosing to be intentional with our time, then it's in those transitions that we get to be the most, um, most, most intentional and most proactive about switching gears. So that'd be a last thought from moi, Ryan. Great. Well, well, uh, Vaughn, why don't you tell us a little bit about elevated leadership and then, um, how people can connect with you and find out more if they're so inclined. Well, thanks so much for asking. Um, so you can find me at elevated-leaders.com. It's my website. Uh, and um, like you, you know, um, I'm, I'm all about um, helping people understand how they're wired, um, how to lead themselves, to know themselves, to lead themselves. Um, I'm here in the spring. So if there's anybody who wants to uh, meet um, you know, personally, uh, that's in your audience here in Colorado. Um, there are a number of giants up and down what we call the front range, which is the, the mountains here. Um, really, uh, I think we're all about um, uh, intentionally uh, leading people to be liberators in the lives of people that we, uh, we lead and influence. And so that's what, that's what in Elevated Leaders is all about. Awesome. Well, we'll put all that, uh, your URL and other contact info in the show notes for everybody. So uh, if you're listening right now and want to 
check out Vaughn or anything that he's doing, uh, go there for that. We're also going to put a link in there for um, not just the five uh, gears diagram, but there's also a, a free five years masterclass that you can check out. And so uh, that link is in there as well. Um, Alexis, anything else I'm forgetting? No, I'm thinking about popping out for a visit to Colorado Springs because I'm just remembering how much I loved, how much I loved being out there, how much I loved doing Pikes Peak. Um, you're making me want to do another trip to Colorado, Vaughn. So you're for more that. than welcome. They uh, they had the peak shut down for uh, a couple okay. weeks now because uh, they've redone the um, the visitor center up there. It used to be a 1960s shack. And now okay. it's a multi-million dollar uh, experience. Wow. <laughs> and so wow. they also redid the cog wheel. So you, you'll you have uh, uh, a lot of fun things to do out here. That's great. No, that's awesome. I'm so glad that you came on, Vaughn. Yeah, thanks, yeah Vaughn. Thanks again for, for being here. We appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening today to the Invincible Teams podcast. Please consider giving us a rating and a review on whatever podcast platform you are currently using. If you think today's content might be useful for someone you know, please consider sharing it with them. Just a reminder that the Invincible Teams podcast is brought to you by Evergreen. Evergreen provides teamwork training and consulting to help you eliminate office drama and turnover and help you get the most out of your team. Thanks again for listening. And like we always say, we believe that every team should reach their potential and that if we get intentional, our teams can become invincible. See you next time.